I found myself a couple of weeks ago in an unenviable position that um, I never like to be in. See, what happened was I, I ordered a, a garage door from Home Depot, and they never delivered the garage door. And so I went to the store to say, I never got the garage door. Is it coming or is it never coming? Because if it's never coming, then I would like to, you know, get my money back. I don't want to make a donation to Home Depot. Great organization as it may be, I, I just not what I want. And uh, so I talked to this young lady working the customer service desk, and we had talked, and she completely understood the situation. You know, it started by saying, you know, well, you'll need, to, if you want a refund on the garage door, you'll need to return it. It's like, but I, I did not get it. But we had passed all of that, which I don't know how you return a garage door. That, that would be pretty tough. But like, I'm like, I never got it. She understands. And she said, I'm sorry. I understand your situation, but there is nothing I can do for you. And you know what I had to say? I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it. I don't want to be that, that guy, right? But I had to say, in fact, like, and I tried to cushion it as much as possible. I tried to cushion it. I was like, you know, you have been so helpful. Thank you so much for all you've done. I, I understand that your hands are tied. There's, you know, nothing more you can do for me. But can I talk to your manager? Oh, like just saying it made me like, I don't, I uh, felt awful. And she was like, yeah, okay. And, you know, kind of went through the point. But I had to talk to the manager. And eventually it all got resolved because I talked to the manager and the manager talked to somebody on, a, on the telephone in some other city. And they talked to somebody who talked to somebody. And I got an email like a week later. You, you know, if, if you were, had to deal with Home Depot before, you understand, right? And so it was a whole kind of thing. The first person, like she was completely sympathetic. She completely understood. She, she said, you know, if it was within my authority to refund this to you, I would do it right now. But I can't. The manager said, if I could just give it back to you, I would, but I can't. And I sat there just sort of thinking, who can? Right? And I was like, well, if you can't, who can? Let me talk to that person. This morning we're going to be looking in Revelation chapter 5 and 6. In Revelation chapter 5 and 6, it starts with a picture of heaven. John is looking at, in the heavenly realm. He is looking at what is going on in heaven, and there is a sense almost, almost, of, of panic, right? And I don't know that, I don't feel like it's necessarily that heaven is panicking, but, but John has a sense of panic because God has made a decree. He has made a decree. It is there. It is in a scroll. It is sealed, and there is no one who can open the scroll. This morning we're going to begin reading in Revelation chapter 5. Let's start with these first few verses. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So this, this sealed scroll, it represents God's divine plan. It is his, his plan, and it is the plan that is the fulfillment sort of of all creation. Like all of the created order is going to find its conclusion, and not just like its end, but like its perfect ending, right? Its perfect ending is right there in the scroll. It's there. Now, I've read a couple of book series. In fact, there was one I read a few years ago. It's, it's a trilogy, and the guy who's written it has written two books. He wrote the first book in like 2013, and then the next one in 2014, and it's been nearly 10 years, 
And I, I want to find his email address. I want to call him. And I'm like, I want to know how the story ends. And John is there. And he says, we need to know how this story ends. We have been through so much over thousands of years, Lord. How does it end? And no one is worthy to open the scroll. No one is worthy to, to break the seal. See, in, in ancient times, they would you know, write a letter, and it would part of the way sort of it was addressed was they would write something, they would roll it up in a scroll, they would wrap it in, in string, and then they would put a wax seal on the knot of the string. And this one in particular, it has seven seals, which... It's using the number seven, as we mentioned last week. Seven is a number that represents completion, that something is, is complete, that it is perfect at that point. And so this isn't just God's will. It is God's perfect will, his perfect conclusion, the completion of his great story of redemption of mankind. It is all right there. But as in ancient times, the seal was sealed so that the correct recipient would get it and only they have the authority to break the seal, untie the knot, and open the scroll. Now, the fact that there's seven, it definitely represents completion. But there was one other instance when seven seals were placed on a legal document in, in Roman culture. And that was when a will was to be read. When a will was to be read, all of, the, uh, all of the inheritors, all of the recipients or beneficiaries of the will would be gathered together, and only once they were gathered together could the seals be broken and the will be read. And so we can almost get a sense here that Jesus is the appropriate inheritor of all that God has done. He is the one. He is the true son of God. He is the one for whom all of this creation has been, has been laid out, that it is all here at Jesus' feet, here and now, and only he is able to open this scroll. In verse 5, he goes on, he says, And one of the elders who was present said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, if we stopped right there, what is Jesus going to look like? He's called, there's a title here. He is the lion of Judah. And I got to tell you, after the treatment that Jesus received at the hands of, of the Romans and of the Jews of his time, after the treatment he's received, I'm ready for him to roar, right? Like He has been God the whole time. He has had equality with the Father but never leveraged it for his own benefit. But now it seems like we're at the point where it's like, here he comes. No more of this sacrificial lamb. Here is the lion, but in verse 6, it says, between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. See, I'm looking for a lion because he says it's the lion of Judah. But in heaven, majesty, glory, power, strength, all of those things are not conveyed in the same way that we think about them here. Here, I'm expecting roaring. I'm expecting, you know, that, a roar that makes people tremble. But in heaven, his, his authority and his might, it isn't, it isn't based in a roar. It isn't based in, in physical strength. It is based in the fact that he was the sacrificial lamb. And so he appears not as a roaring lion. He appears as a sacrificial lamb. And you can almost see this picture that John is there and he is weeping. He is weeping, waiting to see this royal decree opened and read aloud. And here comes Jesus, the only one who is worthy. It describes these seven eyes and seven horns, horns, which represent the eyes, represent God's wisdom and his knowledge that covers all of the earth, all of creation. He, he sees it all. The seven horns represent his power, his authority over all of creation. They are looking for this lion, 
and they find a lamb that still bears the marks of slaughter. Now, I don't know. I don't know what those marks of, of slaughter are, except that I think that I think what John's telling us here is that in glory we'll know Jesus. Just as Thomas knew Jesus, just as Thomas saw those nail scars in his hands and on his feet and felt the hole in his side, that, that the resurrected Savior, the, the one who opens the scroll, still bears those marks. He still bears the marks of his torture and of his death. In verse 8, it says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. See, these, these people, these, these beings that populate the halls of heaven, described as, as elders, described as, as these living beings, which are almost beyond description by human words, these incredible, immaculate creatures in heaven They see a man broken by other men, a man who set aside his authority and his power so that he could be sacrificed. They see Jesus, and they fall at his feet. This this worship that they give Jesus, it underscores the magnitude of his sacrifice. It shows us that the praise that we give him, he is worthy of. He receives that praise. He is worthy of it because of what he has done for the redemption of heaven and earth. You know, one sidebar I'll say here, the the 24 elders, they're, they're described as each holding a harp, which is actually, the word there is a zithern, which is almost like if you can imagine a harp that, that met a guitar, right? Because it's got a hollow body and strings on top, which I thought, perfect day to just have a guitar playing our worship today. Because that's what, that's what the worship would have sounded like there, right? It, there, was no, there were no keyboards, right? Not that there's anything wrong with keyboards, right? There's no, there's no fancy electronic. It's like the most simple instrument is there, and they use it to praise Jesus. They humble themselves, They make much of him. In fact, their worship of Jesus continues for the rest of the chapter, that all the people present in the throne room of heaven sing about his worth. They sing about his honor and his glory and the blessings that he has extended to the world. They worship Jesus as they ought to. In chapter 6, Jesus begins to open the scroll. Chapter 6, Jesus begins to unroll the scroll, except he doesn't actually begin to unroll it, right? He, He has seven seals to break, and there's a description given of what happens each time a seal is broken, each time one of them is broken. It gets it us that much closer to the revelation of of what God is doing at the end of time. And so this is what it says in the first eight verses of chapter 6. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering, and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales on his hand. 
in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and its rider's name was death and Hades followed him and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. There, is, there has been a lot of talk, a lot of discussion. People have written a lot of things about what these four horsemen and these four horses symbolize. Uh, and depending on how you choose to view this apocalypse, this revelation of God, you can see it in some different ways. One group would say this represents, these four horsemen represent uh, phases of the Roman Empire, that there is a time, the first rider represents a time of, of strength and of peace, and then there represents a time of sort of civil war and strife, and then the, there represents, you know, this, where he talks about uh, how a quart of barley will cost this, a denarii, and this much will cost this. What he's describing there, and this is near and dear to all of our hearts in 2023, he's describing inflation, right? A lot of times when we think about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, we think, you know, like he says, pestilence and death and disease and, and inflation is one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. I'm just, that's just kind of how it is. But the description there is, when do we see inflation? Well, we see inflation in times of war. Right? In times of war, there is oftentimes massive inflation, and people start to starve because they can't afford even basics like bread. And then there's the last rider comes out, and he brings death, and hell follows with him, and which you know, sounds very ominous. It's, so is it a description of the first century? If, if you want to believe that this book is just John writing about the Roman Empire, that he's writing sort of a, uh, an encoded description of the Roman Empire, if you want to, you, I think you can kind of squint your eyes a little bit, and you can kind of you can see it there. Some would say that this is a description of the history of the church, of the things that happened from the, the resurrection of Jesus through the, the end of, of time. And again, you can see that. There have been plenty of people who've written plenty of books about that. My personal conviction is that, that here the description is of what is to come. That when events happen, when the course of human history is, is complete or is nearing its conclusion, that Jesus opens these seals so that the end is made known. That the, the, the manifest uh, understanding of that Jesus or that God has had of how things should come to an end will finally come about, and it happens in these seals. Now, these seals are not progressive. It isn't that one is broken. The reason that I believe that it is things that are yet to come and not a discussion of history is, is that these seals don't seem to be progressive. It isn't that the first seal is broken and there's a little bit of the scroll read, and the first writer goes and does his thing, and then there's another seal, and there's a little bit more of the scroll, and, and then a little bit. That's not how scrolls work, right? You, you, you can't break one of them and kind of, you know, peek. It's not like, I don't know, one of my kids, I, I won't say who's really good slash bad at Christmas of figuring out that, you know, you can just kind of open the edge of a package right? It's wrapped under the tree, and if you open just the edge of it, you can tell what is inside of it without having actually opened it. We can even say it was an accident. I don't know how that corner got opened. It was probably the dog, right, which would work if we were giving you beef jerky, but not, not with what we're giving you. Sorry, no, no sale, right? It, this this isn't a present that you can just kind of open the corner and you get a little glimpse of it. This is what is going to happen and is going to happen all at once. When these four horsemen are given reign of authority to, to do what they do on the earth, it is happening simultaneously. It isn't as if they are taking turns one after another. It's not like one is clocking out, the other is clocking on to shift. This is happening all at the same time. 
but it's not happening yet. It's not happening yet in the description that we're reading. So there is an understanding that they each bring a different sort of thing, pestilence and war and, and violence and famine and death. But I said at the beginning of this that when we read Revelation, that it is, it is encoded, right? That there are hundreds of references made to the Old Testament. So what does the Old Testament, let's, let's use the data that's provided to us in the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say about four writers or about four living creatures or about four judgments or about these, these words of, of, of sword and famine, of beasts and pestilence? Well, the first, first place we get a picture of this is in the book of Zechariah, which describes four horsemen. It even describes the coloring of the horses. And there is some difference in the way they're described in, in Zechariah versus how they're described in Revelation, but um, we're talking about two different languages separated by several hundred years. So maybe their understanding of what you know, color looks like could be a little bit different. I think we can forgive a, a little bit of distinction there. But Zechariah describes these four spirits that are sent out by God, and, and their role in, cre in the created order is that they are constantly traveling from the throne room of God and around the world, and that they are preserving peace. They're preserving peace. They're patrolling the earth, and they are keeping peace on earth. In Ezekiel we get a description of four judgments against the earth, and they line up with the four judgments that are given in Revelation, sword, famine, beast, and pestilence. So, as I read Revelation, I think back to what's described in the Old Testament, and to me, it creates a pretty clear picture that these aren't some sort of, you know, just apocalyptic figures that come up out of nowhere, but that these creatures have been here on earth since the beginning. That these have, creatures of these horsemen and these riders, this, it's all been part of God's created order from the beginning. And God has given glimpses of them throughout history, and to John, he gives the best picture. And what we see in, in John's revelation is that God is taking what has existed and what he has put in place to keep the world at peace, and he is now loosing them to let the earth fall into war, to let the world fall into destruction. And these are the, the horsemen of the apocalypse. And there is a way, I think, that we can understand that, that this is really that this is really just, that this is no less than the world deserves. In God's estimation, we have been going this direction. We've been driving ourselves to the brink of destruction for thousands of years. From the beginning, we have looked to seek what is good and destroy it, to corrupt it. We've done this from the beginning, and here God is saying, at the end, I will leave you to your destruction. I will leave you to the mess that you have made out of my beautiful world. And then the fifth seal is opened. Verse 9 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will, before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves have been. So why do I reject the notion that this is a description of history, these horsemen? Why do I reject? Because the martyrs are saying, how long? They're not saying, God, you have finally judged the world. They are not saying, God, you have finally unleashed your wrath on wicked creation. They're saying, how long? They're still waiting. They're still waiting. They are under the altar of the Lord. And the altar of the Lord 
again, we're going to look back to the Old Testament to understand what's, what's going on here. There were a couple of altars in, in the temple mound in that area, one where incense was burned, but the, the altar of the Lord, this one was inside the temple, and it was the place where sacrifices were made. And so the way they made sacrifices, they would take a lamb, and the lamb would be slain. It would have its throat cut, its blood would be spilled. It would be butchered into pieces. And some pieces would be placed on, on essentially a, a barbecue that would be cooked, that it would create a pleasing aroma to the Lord, and some of the pieces would be discarded. And so the, what was under the altar of the Lord were the remaining pieces. It was a place of gore. It was gross. It was d- disgusting. A lot of times I think if you read through the Old Testament and you read, oh, they made these sacrifices, one particular place that they're making sacrifices night and day, day after day after day after day. And if you think about it, it's gross. It's gross. And, but it shouldn't come as a real surprise to us because in the throne room of heaven, Jesus is not depicted as this beautiful lion. He's not, he's not this glorious king of the jungle, right? He's a lamb that shows the marks of slaughter. The Bible, critics of the Bible can say what they want to about it, but the one thing that they cannot say is that the Bible ever sugarcoats anything. The Bible never sugarcoats, it never whitewashes, it never pretends that something wicked that happened was anything but wicked. It gives all of the dirty details of a lot of stuff, and this is one, as it describes these men and women under the altar as being covered in gore until until Jesus calls them out, and he takes away He takes away the marks of violence and the gore that have marked their existence, and he gives them a white robe, and he says, I'm making you pure. I am making you clean. He is celebrating their sacrifice. I'll say more about the fifth seal, but I want to go to the sixth seal for just a a moment. The sixth seal in, in in verse 12 says, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth, the moon full became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The sixth seal triggers cosmic disturbances. It, it begins to signal the events accompanying the end times, and they will lead people to recognize, finally, they will recognize, finally, their need for repentance. They will see that God is on the throne, and they will recognize how desperately they need Him. This is what is coming for the earth. This is the destruction that is, that is waiting, a, a, a time that is so horrible that people will seek out the comfort of caves and they will beg rocks to fall on them, to be crushed by rocks or hidden in fallen rocks rather than to have to face the God who sits on the throne and to face the wrath of the Lamb. See, one of the things I love about this passage, and granted, again, like I said, it, it's dark right? It's pretty dark. 
But you remember when Jesus, you remember when he was, he was walking into Jerusalem and, and the people are crying out? They're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people are all crying out. They're crying out to him as their Lord. And the religious authorities of the time, they're like, hey, you need to tell these people, tell these people to stop crying out to you as Lord. And Jesus says, if they don't, if they don't cry out to me, if they don't give me their worship, these rocks will worship me. To worship, they'll fall down. He says, if they don't worship me, these rocks, they will all fall down at my feet. These rocks will all cry out if these people don't worship me. Jesus said this was coming. He said, there's going to come a time when the mountains, when the islands, when they are all moved, when they are all shaken, when they all fall down, and the people will hope that they are crushed by the falling stones rather than to face Jesus. He told them it was coming. He told them, I'm, I am the Lord. It may not look like it now in a dirty robe. I may not look like it not having the political authority and clout that you guys have. I, got, I don't have an army at my back. I have, you know, 12 dudes. One of them's actually conspiring with y'all against me. And John's, a, you know, a, a young teenager. Peter, I let him walk on water, and he still can't get anything right, right? I don't have an army at my back. Peter's going to try to cut your head off. He's going to settle for an ear, right? But I am the Lord. Don't make mistake about it. The rocks will testify. In Revelation, John's saying, the rocks will testify. This great cosmic disturbance will signal that the end is coming. I want to spend just a minute, though. I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back to that altar and what's going on in that altar. Because it, we hear that that the number of people under the altar is great, but that it is going to grow, and that, and that the Lord will not release his judgment, that he will not judge the world until that number is complete. And I, I just want us to understand, I guess, what it means about that number of the souls that are under the altar, because it's large. Of course, we know Stephen first Christian martyr, that he's there, that he's there, that he told the truth. He gave a testimony of what God has done through his pe people across the generations, and he said, and then he sent Jesus, and you murdered him. And they said, well, we'll murder you too, bud. And they crushed him with rocks, and he took his place under the altar. Fifty years later, a man named Polycarp was an outspoken defender of the faith he was an evangelist, and he would not, no matter how much the Romans threatened him, he would not recant the testimony that he had given of Jesus. He was brought out into a coliseum, and, and he was said, you know, he, he was told to, to dismiss his atheism because he only believed in one God instead of all the God. And he, he basically said, oh, I see all the atheists. They threatened him to burn him to death. And he said, you threaten me with an hour of fire, but you will face an eternity of fire. And they didn't take that well, and they lit him up. And Polycarp is there under the altar. And Blandina was a woman who was a follower of Jesus and the Roman government, they told her to recant, to take back the things that she had said about Jesus, and she would not. And so they began to torture her, and they used tortures that I will not share here. I will say this, that one of them was to put her on a heated iron chair and melt her skin to the chair. And when they did that, she said, I will not recant. And they tied her down to the ground so that wild animals could come and eat her. And the animals didn't. But she said, even if they do, I will not recant. And eventually they tied her up in a net and they threw her into a pen with a wild bull. And he killed her. And she's there under the altar. 
And time passed, and more and more and more martyrs gave their lives because of their testimony, because they would not stop telling people about what Jesus has done. Men like John Huss, who said that what the church was doing was wrong, that they had lost the truth of the gospel. Men like William Tyndale, who said that people should be able to read the Bible for themselves in their own language. They were taken, they were killed, and their souls are under the altar of the Lord. And in the last century, in the 20th century, the number of people killed for their faith was greater than every century before it combined. In 1915, Turkish Ottoman authorities killed 600,000 Armenians for being Christians. Lenin said there can be nothing more abominable than religion, and he ordered the persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church, killing untold thousands of Russian Orthodox believers. Stalin extended that persecution to all believers and sent thousand more to go under the altar of the Lord. In 1956, Ayuka Indians of Ecuador killed Jim Elliott and his, his friends, and they're there with the souls of those martyrs. In 1975, 10,000 Cambodian Christians were slain by the Khmer Rouge. And the souls of the martyrs are there. Christians being slain in China today are there. Christians being slain in Iran and Indonesia are there. And they cry out, how long? But I think for John, I think for John maybe the most important ones were not the ones of, that would come, but by the time John sees this, because he was in his 80s, 50, 60 years of church history had passed before he has seen this. And as he looks under the altar of the Lord, he sees Paul beheaded for his faith in Rome. He sees his friend Andrew, Peter's little brother. He sees Andrew crucified on an X-shaped cross. He sees Nathaniel. He sees Thomas speared to death. He sees Matthew cut to pieces by a sword. He sees Peter, his friend, his companion, the one who walked on water, the one who was there with him for the transfiguration, the one who was there with him when Jesus was sweating blood in the garden. He sees Peter crucified upside down on a cross, and he's there under the altar, and he sees his brother. He sees James, the first of the apostles to be killed. He sees his own big brother, and he hears him cry out, how long, oh Lord, until you will judge this world? There are two things that I think we should take away from this passage. The first is certainly that Jesus is worthy. That Jesus is worthy. If all creation will bow, if they will all take the knee to kneel, to fall on their faces before Jesus, he is worthy. Let us not, let us not treat him as if he is anything less than that. We cannot, we cannot say, we cannot believe, we cannot tolerate the idea that he was a good man, that he was a a moral teacher. No, he is the son of God and nothing less than that. He is the one who is worthy. He is the one who is worthy to take the scroll from the hand of the king, the father who sits on the throne to open the seals and to end this world the way that it is supposed to. He alone is worthy. The second thing I think we have to take away from that is that not only is Jesus worthy, but the gospel is worth it. The gospel is worth it. It is worth the sacrifices that we have to make for it. It is worth the sacrifices that we're called on. It is worth, it is worth awkward conversations with people about our faith. It is worth 
posting things on social media so that people know the truth of the gospel. The gospel is worth it. The gospel is worth it's worth losing friendships or potentially losing friendships by talking about your faith. It is worth making Thanksgiving uncomfortable for your grandkids and your kids by talking about who Jesus is. It is worth it. The gospel is worth it. Too many people, too many people from the first generations of Christians to the current generation of Christians have given Everything, everything that they are, everything that they have, and everything they ever will have, they have given it all for the gospel. And we can't treat it as if it is worth less than that. We have to remember that this gospel is worth it. So my friends, my hope and my prayer for you as you read through this book, as you read this revelation from God, is that you remember those two things that Jesus alone is worthy and the gospel is worth it.